it is just a huge honor to bring back to the show and podcast for a second time, Dr. Sylvana Burai, DDS, MSc, PhD, graduated in 2004 from Tirana University, Albania in 2005. She graduated with a master's degree in fixed prosthodontics, dental occlusion in Tirana, Albania. In 2013, she got a PhD in fixed prosthodontics, dental occlusion. She started teaching fixed prosthodontics in Crystal University in 2006. She was a dean of faculty of dentistry in Vitriana University. She lectures in uh, fixed prosthodontics, dental occlusion uh, in Sinai University. Her, her resume literally goes on for 40 days and 40 nights. So basically, she lectures and teaches all over Albania, Macedonia, Greece, Italy, Egypt, India, Dubai, Sultan of Oman, Brazil, Mexico, uh, Greater New York meeting. Uh, when I go, had the honor of lecturing in uh, um, Albania, uh, I got to meet her and listen to her lecture. How are you doing today? Good year. I'm trying to get involved in dentistry in America. I'm here for, since one year. And believe me, it's a challenge. Coming here in my age and starting over from the scratch is a big challenge. But it's worth it. I'm glad to be here and to start again from national board exams. You know how hectic are those days of national boards. But sounds great to me because it's just giving me a refresh, a new starting of everything in dentistry. Well, you know, so many people are going to relate to this podcast because um, at least um, 1% of all earthlings live in a country that they weren't born in. There's seven and a half billion people. And a lot of people um, are changing countries. So I, I want to really hear about that story. Um because a lot of people that are born in the same country, you know, if you're born in Canada, Canada and practice your life in Canada, you would know what it's like to come from Europe and start over. So first of all, why would you, uh, I lectured in Albania. Why, why did you want to leave the, such a beautiful country of Albania? What made you want to leave there and come here? Is, was it love? I see. There are two main reasons that I moved from two Albania. Two main reasons, love and something else. <laughs> and, um, my passion to work in a research, big research center. I don't have possibility, we don't have big centers of studies in Albania. So I want to get involved and make a huge study in temporomandibular disorders. I wasn't able to do in Albania. Uh, so I was planning to come and get involved in these programs in America, but um, my husband came in my clinic. He was trying to get to fix his teeth. So we fell in love. And so we decided to get married and to leave my beautiful country, because my, my husband is Albanian too, with, in origin. So we decided to change our country and come and live in America. So yes. your husband's from Albania too? Yes, he's Albanian too. He's Albanian American, actually. But. Yeah, and um, so you've been over here one year. Yeah. So what's it like, um, um, foreign trained dentist? I remember when I got out of school in '87, I came to um, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and I needed a job for four months while they were building my dental office. And they mm -hmm. said uh, one of the places I was hiring there was this like 85 year old lady. And um, so I went and met with her and she had left Germany because of the war and mm -hmm. she got to America and here, here she's from Germany and America wouldn't accept her dental license. She's like, come on, we make Mercedes Benz, you make Chrysler. Um, you know, um, she, she was, she, she knew so much more than any American counterpart. I mean, the Germans, even their lab technicians probably know more than many of our dentists. And um, she just thought it was horrible, but it was the, it was, she said it was the best thing that happened to her because since they took away her hands, she was forced to just own a dental office and hire dentists. And because of that, she now had four locations and she had this big limousine and, and this driver would drive her to her four offices every day. And she says, Howard, I'm, I'm 85. I, I wouldn't have been able to do dentistry at this age anyway. But since they took it away from me as a youth, 
it forced me to make lemons out of lemonade. So I was wondering, uh, did it, uh, uh, with all the DSOs, did you think of, ah, uh, forget the boards and forget hands-on. I'm just going to start my own DSO. I'm just going to start a dental clinic. And where are you at right now? Philadelphia? Yeah, Philadelphia. Can you see the Liberty Bell from your from your window? No, no. I'm <laughs> in North East Philadelphia. I'm not able to see the, the table. <laughs> but uh, I cannot live without my patient, Howard. I need to work with my hands. So I have a passport. <laughs> I cannot just manage dental offices. It sounds great, economically at least. But for me, no, I want to work. I want to feel the, I want to smell dentistry and I don't smell just managing or just lecturing. I love lecturing. It's my half part, but in the same time, I want to smell dentistry. I want to smell saliva and blood. Sorry. <laughs> I nice. Know nice. I, I, would, I would want you to be my doctor. That, that's a, that, that's a, a passion. So, so when, when you come to America, you have to, what do you have to do? You start with national board. Well, first of all, is how hard is it to come even to America? I know it was that a hard process. How long did it take you before deciding you want to move here? And uh, what would you do? You go, go online, fill out a form. What, how, how was that? Basically, for me, it wasn't difficult because I was, uh, I was applying for participating in an international conference. For me, it was easy. I don't know, for others. I can share my personal experience. It was easy as you can get it. And after that, making the marriage and everything go in the process, the hard part is to know the fact that I have to start and study all materials from the first year of education in dental schools. So uh, studying again uh, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, believe me, I, I had forgot all those reactions, chemical reactions in our body. But it helped me a lot. It helped me a lot to understand more the pathophysiology of the uh, of the masticatory system. So it is uh, the best thing to happen to me because I am feeling much more stronger. My knowledge are refreshed, and I'm feeling that uh, my subject. I am much more competent in my subjects right now. That's, that, that's... No exams. That is great, and and is your um you you've studied and taught in so many areas um I prosthodontics occlusion um what what is your what is your main um what what is your main love is it prosthodontics is it occlusion or, or dental occlusion dental occlusion inside the field of fixed prosthodontics so rehabilitation of dental occlusion with fixed prosthodontics this is my subject of my PhD and and um. What I always wondered is, it, it, when you look at the 10 specialties, I mean, there's orthodontics, there's endodontics, there's pediatric dentistry, most of the specialties don't have many um, arguments or disagreements. In, in pediatric dentistry, there's a lot of um, disagreement about silver diamine fluoride. Um, in orthodontics, there's really not that many, but occlusion and TMJ, that seems to have more I almost think it's like world religion. There's more world religions in TMJ. You have your, you know, your your Buddhists and your Hindus, and uh, you have a whole spectrum. Why, why do you think um, dental occlusion has so many different camps? There are a lot of reasons for that, Howard. First of all is the fact that uh, TMJ problems or diseases or pathology is just an umbrella term. It encompasses a lot of pathology, pathologies, including temporal mandibular joint, masticatory muscles, teeth, and all associated structure. The second is the fact is the fact that in dentistry we are perceived, we are perce we are taught to perceive unidimensionally. What I want to make with this, for example, if a dentist in any country of the world diagnosed a di uh, carious disease. A decade. But the treatment protocol, it would be exactly the same, with a difference just using composite or amalgam as filling materials. All the other steps, it will be exactly the same. But if a, if a dentist is treating TMJ problem, his 
let's let's say he's numb in front of this problem because we are not trained to think multidimensionally. So we are fallen in the vicious cycle of treating what we see and see what you treat. For example, if a dentist, a GP, is seeing as a cause of the temporal mandibular disorder muscles, what he does? He treats using occlusal splint or occlusal deprogrammer. If a dentist is seeing as the cause of the temporal mandibular dysfunction, the teeth, he's treating using occlusal equilibration. And if the dentist is a surgeon, he's willing to treat this TMD with joint surgery. So we don't have a single or unique approach. Another reason is the fact that we are taught to see the masticatory system as an isolated entity without the body. So we are dentists and we are focused on treating only teeth. As the teeth was outside of the body and we don't want to hear that this dental occlusion is connected with our postural behavior and with the way how we speak and how we walk. And the most important, in medicine, not only in dentistry, but in medicine, we are taught to treat the diseases, but not to treat the patients. We want to have a clear schema, disease, diagnose, treatment method methodology. If we have puzzling problems, puzzling pathology like temporal mandibular dysfunction, we are totally numb and we are working blindly and guessworking. Another problem is the fact that we have a big issue in the terminology of dental occlusion. And on my opinion, this is the main cause of the problems. Different definition of CR, oh, centric relation, from 1987, uh, uh, something like that. The uh, they totally changed the definition of centric relation from most, most uh, posterior to most anterior superior position of the TMJ in the glenoid fossa and so on. So we don't have a clear terminology and this terminology is not based on clear fact but is most empirical, unfortunately. This is the main problem in dental occlusion, on my point of view. So why, what, it, what makes you attracted to it then? How come it didn't make you go into uh, restorative dentistry or endodontics? Why, why were you attracted to this, um, what is it's obviously the, the, the more challenging? I mean, we treat cario, perio, and occlusion. Why did you pick the hard one? Because it's like a puzzle to me and make me think and make me love the industry more. I mean, it's not easy to, uh, to understand what's the problem in a particular, in a special patient, of, uh, what, what is the source of TMJ in a particular patient. is challenging. You have to think, you have to understand how the patient is living his life, how the patient is treating his whole body, not only masticatory system. This is a challenge and I like it. <laughs> So, um, your last post on Dental Town was um, um, on the thread, Pete Dawson No More. You said, RIP to the most amazing and most influential guru in dentistry. Uh, what, what did Pete Dawson um, mean to you? And what do you think uh, will be some of his first um, concepts that will um, withstand the test of time? And what concepts do you think will not stand the test of time? First of all, I'm so sorry that I didn't have a chance in my life to meet physically Peter Dawson. Even that Peter Dawson is living with me every day of my life since I was student in master degree in Albania. Peter Dawson and particularly his book, uh, Functional Occlusion from TMJ to Small Design, is my Bible in dental occlusion makes me understand occlusion. Thanks to Peter Dawson, I understand and I fell in love with occlusion. Otherwise, 
believe me, Howard, with all studies that I made in my country, in my university, I wasn't able to understand the occlusion. Because, you know, unfortunately, in our dental schools, not only in Albania, but worldwide, we are focused on just explaining to the students what is the occlusional interference, what is the intercaspal position, how it's working in lateral intrusive, and so on. But we are not trying to help patient, students to understand how can we use this information in a real patient? How can I use this information to understand me? What is going wrong in the occlusion of this patient? Okay, I noticed some occlusional interferences, so what? What this occlusional interference is, is creating in my occlusion of my patient? Believe me, 90% of dentists doesn't know this. So they are trying to do the uh, occlusional equilibration blindly without understanding the principle of dental occlusion. So, Peter Dawson, to me, is the father of dental occlusion. He's the creator of my world in TMJ. What a nice tribute. Um, in... In America, it, it, you know, the United States is, I mean, it, it's a huge country. There's 211,000 dentists. And most of the dentists, the whole concept of TNJ comes down to, we'll, we'll, we'll say the 80-20 rule. For 80% of the people, if you say, well, I grind my teeth, my, I have TMJ issues, um, they're going to um, take an uh, alginates, they're going to make a, an upper splint, you're going to come back a week later, they deliver a splint, they check the bite, you're done. That is four out of five treatments for all TMJ in the United States of America. What would you tell somebody who's listening right now, um, if, th if that's really their, their whole TMJ protocol, what would, you, what would you say to those people? I'm so sorry to say to those people that, that this is totally wrong. I mean, you cannot help a patient just taking an uh, alginata impression and building an, uh, um, the programmer. The programming is just helping you to diagnose and to diagnose that you have to deal with the temporomandibular dysfunction and helping you, just helping the dentist to deprogram muscles and to hide the muscular engram that is trying to fool us the dentist. So with the programmer, we just, or with occlusal splint, we can help the muscles to get relaxed. And after the muscles are relaxed, we can record the centric relation. Without recording the centric relation, we cannot help the patient to solve the grinding and clenching problem. Just making an orthotic with the uh, alginate impression is totally wrong. We just making a camouflage of all situation and the patient is coming back and back and back because we are not treating, uh, we are not treating the etiology. We are treating just the symptom. We are not helping the patient. We are dam damaging more than more. Nice, nice, nice. Um, so, a lot of kids, when they come out of school, um, they say, um, you know, they have a lot of student loan debt, but they're, they're glad to be out of school. But, you know, they've been in school eight years. They average $285,000 student loans. And they say, I, I didn't get to do a case of clear aligners like Invisalign. I didn't get to place an implant. And they don't feel like they learned enough occlusion. What would you say to somebody who's 25 that just walked out of school and she says, I want to learn more occlusion? What, what, what path would you put her on? What, what would you tell her to do? I'm going to tell them to do exactly what I did on my path. Because believe me, in my country, in my time, we didn't have even books. We are trying to write what the professor was saying in the lecture to be able to prepare for the exam. We didn't have book in my time. So writing all, I was the master of writing in speed, you know, just to catch what the professor was explaining. And believe me, I wasn't able to understand nothing of occlusion. What helped me a lot is studying on my own in my home with 
the books of Peter Dawson. Starting from zero to endless, because, you know, studying never ends. I'm not saying from A to Z, because Z is the point of ending the knowledge. In biology, in, biology, in physiology, we don't have an end forward. So I'm still studying, and I will study until at the last day of my life. We can't stop in studying. Just start, be focused, and believe me, the best approach in studying and understanding occlusion is manuals written from Peter Dawson. Is the concept that he all the concept that he was right in his books is just recording and copying the nature. And if you are copying and recording the nature, you will never work in blindly. You are trying, we are trying to help our patient based on the fact that trying to give them the most harmonious relationship between functional and aesthetic. How can we do this? We can do this just respecting physiology of our body. And we cannot, we are not able to understand the physiology if we don't study the physiology of each individual patient. So if a student of just graduated student want to learn about occlusion, has to be focused on Dawson theories. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sounding as a broken record, but it's the best for me. Um, a lot of people, um, they start really thinking about TMD a lot when they're treating someone with extreme wear, extreme erosion. I mean, what, what, do you, what, what goes through your amazing mind when a patient walks in and they literally grind their teeth down to nubs? And, you know, usually they show up in the dental office and they don't like their smile. They they severe worn dentition. It's usually a 50, 60-year-old man. Um, what, what, what do you think when you see a case like that? Uh, unfortunately, among us, among dentists, the concept of uh, abrading the teeth is normal with age. In fact, according to Dawson, Abrasion of teeth is not normal with age. If a masticatory system is working harmoniously, is perfect occlusion, the teeth never will be worn out. So if the patient, if my patient has worn teeth, means that something is wrong, something is going wrong in his masticatory system, and I have to find out. But on my point of view, we haven't just to focus on the masticatory system. We have to see how the patient is living, how the patient is using his body, not only masticatory system. The masticatory system is our main topic, I totally agree. But is um, mostly of time is the expression of our, uh, let's say, limbic system. So our masticatory system is managed not only by ne uh, central nervous system, but it's managed by limbic system. Why? If you are nervous, Howard, what you are doing in normal day, you are clenching your teeth, doing nothing, reading, or working in your patient. Your mind is stressed out, and you're clenching your teeth. Your muscles are working hardly. This is because of the limbic system. Because, you know, the masticatory system is just an orchestra of, mus of muscles working all together. There are 138 muscles in masticatory system, neck and head, working in harmony to give us even a small smile. To be able to smile, have to work 136 muscles all together. To clench, to close the mouth, to, to swallow, to masticate. All these muscles have to work in harmony with each other, but not only with each other, but with all muscular orchestra of our body. So if I see a patient with worn out teeth, I have to start from the scratch. I have to examine every details 
of the puzzles called health. Unfortunately, we are trained to see that we have this symptom is related with this etiology and is treated in this protocol. The health is not like is not uh, such easy. We have to have mind. We have to think out of the box. We have to be more more um, vital, and we have to integrate all parts of mechanical and emotional behavior to be able to understand what is going on, not only in the masticatory system of our patient, but in whole body. Very nice. Um, are you familiar with Jim Boyd? Yeah, I heard about him. Um, <laughs> yeah, Jim Boyd, um, he's on Dentaltown a lot, and there, he's a one of the people who... Um, Associate a lot of uh, migraines with TMJ, TMD. Um, <laughs> is that a do, do you associate that way? Um, migraines, TMD, TMJ. Is that um, associated with you? Uh, I am um, me. I personally, I ha I am fact of this association because I was suffering a lot from migraine, taking at least three or four Oki's. Per day, okay, is um, acetaminophen used in Albania too much, and I start to use as uh, okay lingually to help me to get rid of that heavy migraine that I I had it when I was working. What I start to do, Howard, I start to reorganize my masticatory system according to Delson principles. I start to be more aware where my tongue was located. And changing, just changing the position of tongue. I was convinced that my tongue was in rest, rest position. And what is rest position? Just de as a definition, we have problem even in this. <laughs> rest position of tongue, if you're gonna Google on this topic, you're gonna see a lot of differences. A rest position is the moment when we have minimum expenditure of energy to keep the tongue or any organ in the position, right? But in uh, accordance to tongue, this is not right. Because we want the tongue be positioned on the top behind of the frontal teeth, on the top of inside of papilla. And to be able to keep the tongue in the position, believe me, it's not rest position. Muscles, intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of tongue have to be contracted to hold the tongue in that position. It is the most physiological position of the tongue. Keeping the tongue in that position helped me to deal, to deal with my migraine. Believe it or not, it's true. So, Just taking care about what I was doing. Because you know, Howard, we are trained, we are used to understand the parafunctional of masticatory system, like braxing and clenching. This is parafunctional function, right? And we are not used to understand parafunctional position. Having the tongue rest down on the, on the floor of the mouth is a parafunctional position. We are not doing any function. It's not parafunctional, but it's parafunctional position because we are used a lot of energy to having our tongue or our structure of our organ, doesn't matter, in a non-physiological position. And we are spending energy on doing that. And think about 24 hours in day, because how much do, you, do, we, do we talk? Let's say two or three hours per day? How much do we eat? 40 minutes per day? And the rest, what we are doing with our tongue? Pretending to put our tongue in a resting position. But what's our resting position of the tongue? This is the main problem in, in dental occlusion, terminology. So when um, you've lectured and taught around the world, I mean, when I met you in Albania, you had taught every around, I mean, Italy, Greece, Egypt, all around. 
Um, do you think the disease of TMJ, TMD, um, whatever, do you think it's different in different parts of the world? I mean, or, or do you think it's a, a homogenous disease? I mean, would it be the same in Brazil as it is in China, same as Albania, as Egypt or Italy? You are saying as prevalence of disease or as the concept of uh, among dentists? Um, just I any variance, any variance um, at all. In prevalence and in the dentist per perceived. Perceiveness. Uh, as dental perceive, as, uh, perceiveness among dental, dental professionals, let me give you a, per, a personal experience. In uh, 2013 or 2014, something like that, I was lecturing in uh, Skopje, Macedonia, in international dental conferences. Where Mother Teresa is from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's Albanian, by the way. Yes. And um, I was lecturing occlusal diseases, how we see in our daily practice. The, this was my, the topic of my lecture. And I was explaining the dental uh, the occlusal diseases, uh, the definition and blah, 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 how we see, how we can help the patient. And the dean of Tirana University at the time, an amazing lady that I love it so much. She was so angry with me because I was using terminology occlusal disease, not occlusal pathology. And she was, she started a war with me in the middle of the conference. It's not correct. It's not scientifically correct to say occlusal pathology. Okay, you can imagine she was my professor and the dean, and I was just a child, let's say. I said, professor, it's not my opinion of calling occlusal disease. Is Peter Dawson? I'm just following his legacy, and I believe in his legacy. It's occlusal disease. What do you have to call occlusal pathology? <laughs> so, the perceiveness of occlusal problems is vague and is different from a dentist to a dentist, from a professor to a professor. Unfortunately, this is the main problem in dental occlusion about the prevalence. I think the more uh, developed are the countries, the more people are concerned with the, uh, the stress and uh, the pain, or official pain. In the poor country, like unfortunately my Albania is, the people are most um, focused on surviving than giving a lot of attention to their health. And uh, treating oral facial dysfunction, if it's not acute, but it, if it's chronic, believe me, it's luxury. In poor country, treating TMD, a, a chronic TMD is a luxury. The people are trying to, to treat only acute symptomatology. Another, um, another controversy or debate in this is, uh, some people think that it's very mechanical with forces and teeth and jaws and joints. And some people think it's very psychological. Um, how do you, um, where do you put TMD from mechanical forces to psychological forces? I mean, when someone's grinding their teeth, may, maybe they just lost their job, they're going through a divorce, their dog got ran over by a dump truck. Um, does any of this stuff um, weigh into it? Or we have to think outside of the box. If you are training our mind just to see as mechanical, it will be always mechanical to us. No matter how was the social life or the social problem of our patient. If you are used to see as only psychological problem, we are be focused only in the psychological uh, influences. As Vince Lombardi state in his philosophy of football, there will be only two or three players that will determine winning or losing a game. But I'm sorry, I'm not able. I'm not able to say who of them are these determinants. You have to play all of them hundred percent. So, even mechanical, even biological, even psychological effects has a huge influence in TMD etiology. 
I'm sorry, I'm not able to say in your specific, in your specific case, which is the main influence. You have to play all 100%. You have to be focused on all details in these puzzles. It's not just, it's mechanical, in every case it's mechanical. It's psychological, in every case it's psychological. We can, say, we can treat patients in this way. Another huge controversy in uh, dentistry and TMJ is that, um, you know, we learn about the curve of speed, the curve of Wilson. We learn about all these things, but then we take our, our, our important children and we send them to the orthodontist between, you know, 12, 13, 14, and they um, kind of change the curve of speed, the curve of Wilson. A lot of them take out wisdom teeth. A lot of them change the bite. There's a lot of dentists on T on uh, dental town that do not like the way America puts all their youth through the orthodontic factory. And, um, and then when they get them back, so how do you, so I call it the aesthetic health compromise. Mom just wants her baby to look pretty enough to get married and make her a grandchild someday. She really doesn't care about the curve of speed or the curve of Wilson. Um, what letter grade do you give the orthodontist? Um, do you do you think they're um, helping TMJ, hurting TMJ? What what would what letter grade? I mean, you have a PhD in occlusion. Um, what would you um, what would you say to the orthodontic industry? Honestly, Howard, I love the uh, orthodontics because they can be tremendous help in treating TMJ. But unfortunately, the majority. It's just doing a holocaust in our kids. Disorganizing everything, occlusal curve, speed curve, some curve, and not taking in account how the teeth fit together, not only how the teeth fit together, but how this intercuspal position is fitting, is harmonious with TMJ occlusion, is just creating a disaster in masticatory system of our kids. The orthodontic treatment is just focused in a perfect alignment of anterior teeth. And what is going on in the back teeth, which, is our, which are the most important sensor of our system, which are the most important part of our system, they are not taken into consideration. And the children, how they are using their teeth, how they are using their tongue, how they are using their lips is fundamental in how the bones are organizing, how the bones are a position and a resorption at the same time to remodeling the form and the shape of the bone and, and the face. You know, um, I had 17 niece and nephews in total. But my last niece, she has my heart. She's seven or eight years old right now. But when she was in kindergarten in Albania, three or four years old, uh, it was cool in her kindergarten to talk with moving uh, uh, the lip on one side. So having parafunction, uh, ha having a habit. I noticed my niece talking to me and her, t uh, her lip was moving, was shifting on one side. And I was so stressed out, what is going on? This is going to lead to an asymmetry of the, uh, of the of not only of the lip, but also to the to the jaw. Because, you know, on the symmetry of the lip, I can re reorganize with Botox or with fillers, who cares? But why we have to have this asymmetry on the face? And I went to her kindergarten, and you know how our from 32 kids in the kindergarten, more than 24 were talking in that way, just to be to feel cool among them. So it's not orthodontic. Should be focused, should be directed to help our kids to erase all this habit and to erase all these discrepancies, to have a perfect occlusion. But not only perfect alignment of our of the teeth, but perfect harmonization between intercuspal teeth and the position of the condyle in glenoid fossa. Are they are they doing this? I'm sorry, I cannot say. I'm not saying that all orthodontic treatments are working blindly. 
I can't dare to say that, but the majority, believe me, they are working blindly. If the orthodontist is really care about the health of their patient, they have to give much more uh, consideration to the dental occlusion. Just all I can say. Um, a lot of the kids have a very specific question. They, they come out of school and they say um, there's two types of camps. One's more Dawson CR. One's more called neural linguist, uh, neural lingual um, TMJ. And, and if they go that route, it's more LVI, but they need to buy equipment. Um, there, you know, there's some ten thousand dollar pieces of uh, myofunctional uh, equipment they they need. Um, if some kid came out of school and they had a lot of student loan debt, would you say in learning TMJ that they need equipment? And and the same question is CBCT. Uh, some TMJ people say they don't want to treat this with a panel anymore; that they want to. 3D CBCT view of each joint. Some people say, well, I want a myotronitor, um, et cetera. But, so the question is, uh, what equipment do you need to do what you do? You have a PhD in TMJ. Can you do it without expensive equipment? I would be crazy to say that we don't need a CTC or MRI to uh, diagnose how to diagnose our patient. But believe me, Howard, if we want to help our patient, we can start from basic. And basic is not CT scan, is not RMI. Basic is to understand how the system is working. Believe me, you don't need expensive equipment. They are helpful a lot, but it's not the basic. If you are not if you are not able to understand the basic, the basic, you can't deal with the expensive equipments. So, without understanding the basic, starting from the basic, and with a year, for sure, you can buy expensive equipment, why not? But not from the start. Because it's going to um, prevent you from understanding how the physiology is working. Um, another controversy. Some people think that um, sleep apnea um, is all TMD related. There, there's, there's some people that, that think it's malpractice not to uh, um, treat, um, that, that if you have any type of uh, bruxing, TMJ, any TMD issues that you need to be worked up uh, for sleep apnea. Um, do you think sleep apnea and TMD um, are related? Or are they, or do they overlap? How, how would you line those two categories up? Uh, honestly, uh, sleep apnea and uh, TMJ problem can uh, overlap to each other. It's not that TMJ is causing sleep apnea or sleep apnea is causing TMJ, but they can be a co a cooperator into each other. And it would be helpful to work. You know, the most important concept is to work with other professional in medicine and to speak the same uh, language, to speak the same language is the main topic. I mean, to be able to help a patient that is suffering from sleep apnea, maybe this patient he's, has in the same time a TMJ problem and we have to work with, uh, nar uh, how is it called in, in English, the otorhinolaryngologue, otorhinolaryngologue, otorhinolaryngologue. The, the medic, the med, the doctor of uh, ears and uh, larynx. I just called? call him ENT. I can't pronounce the word. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> can't pronounce about what, me. what is it? Oto, yeah, ENT, otolaryngologist. Here, I'll try to. Uh... Uh, we have to work in junction with these doctors to help our patient because maybe these problems are just aggravating each other. But not only, even with the oculist the doctor of the eye, we have to work. Because, you know, for example, hypertellurism or tellurism is just the expression of, of muscular dysfunction in masticatory system. We have to work with osteopath, with uh, doctor of ears and larynx, with oculist to understand what is going on in our patient. 
There are a lot of studies that say, said that sleep apnea is more um, diso- movement disorder because during sleep apnea, in, in uh, also during bruxism, there are movement of lower extremities. So how can you help this patient? We have to work with neurologists too. Can we treat the bruxism only with grinding or a night uh, splint guard? We are fooling ourselves and patient too. What about if we what, don't what, have what, holistic approach, holistic view of what is going on in this specific patient, we can't help him. Do you ever see a need for pharmacology in your patients? Pharmacology is trying to convince you and your patient that you have to deal with the disease. I mean, pharmacology is trying treating the symptomatology. It's just making camouflage. It's not treating. Pharmacology is not treatment at all. In TMD, on my point, we should erase the concept of treatment, pharmacologic treatment. It's just helping you to relate to, in extreme cases, by the way, you can use uh, carti- uh, steroids only in extreme cases to release muscles, but it's not treating at all. It's not the treatment. You are fooling yourself if you are thinking that with the painkiller, you are treating TMD. After one week, or after finishing the, the painkiller, the patient will come back to your office like Sylvester. He came back so quickly because the doctor never found out the real etiology. So, um... It's, like, it's just like Botox, you know? There are a lot of dentists all over the world that are treating bruxism or TMD with injection of botulinum in uh, botulinum, but but up. But it's not correct. You are just making you are sleep. You are making muscles to sleep for six months. After that, after that, what? Everything will come back and maybe worse. Well, a lot of people think that um, I have had Botox and cosmetic surgery, and I want you to know that I am all natural. Those are all, all but, rumors. Yeah, I have Botox in my front. You have Botox in your front? <laughs> I have Botox, yeah, for sure. It's aesthetically, it's perfect. Because, you know, I am a person that I speak with all my spirit. And when I speak, I use all my mimics, all my muscles to express what I'm trying to say. I, I'm a teacher, so I want... Everyone in my audience understand what I'm trying to, to share with you. And to do this, I use all my uh, body language. It's wrong. So I have to control this with but also. <laughs> um, let, let's go from um, occlusion as a disease to more occlusion and, and restorative life. Um, some people, um, like myself, I'm older, I am... Um, all my crowns and fillings are all gold because they're, they're, they're soft. Um, some, some people think that the move that porcelain fused the metal was more acceptable than this zirconium. Some people think zirconium is so hard that since it will not break that, that the force is going to actually fracture more roots and cause more endo down the line. I don't know any about that, but when you're looking at occlusion, um, and, uh, or, you know, does gold to porcelain to zirconia to Emacs, um, do any of those things, um, affect your treatment plan? Honestly, this, uh, is connected with the correct case selection. I mean, it will be different in a bruxer. It will be different in a brachocephalic patient. It will be different in a dolicocephalic patient. It will be different in a patient that has a lot of stress. It will be different in a patient that uh, is, uh, like me, using all muscles to express. I mean, the success, long, longevity in, if, of all treatments depends on the correct case selection. If you 
select correctly your case for porcelain fused metal, it would be perfect for your occlusion. What is, what, what is wrong? But if in another case, if your patient is, uh, you know, is a dolicocephaly, his muscles are, are not strongly clenching, is not strongly contracting, are not uh, directing a lot of uh, forces along to the teeth, okay, do zirconia, you know? Or if your patient should have zero negativity in his mouth, zero negative influences in his mouth, do it gold. It's the perfect, it's the most perfect material that we ever had in dentistry. Okay, it's not aesthetic. I totally agree. But this is the main disadvantage of gold, only aesthetic. If you are using Emax, zirconium, porcelain fused metal, or gold, depends all on comprehensive evaluation of the dental occlusion of the patient. I can't say this is good or this is bad. Depends on the case. Um, you do a lot of talking and writing on stable TMJ or stable occlusion. What, what, what do you mean by stable TMJ or stable occlusion? Uh, the majority of dentists are working based on stable occlusion, stable intercuspal position. What we are checking in our daily practice, how the patient is making intercuspal position, lateral movement, protrusive, it's according to our rules, perfect, the patient let him go. I was uh, two months ago here in Pennsylvania, it was a um, private lecture of one professor from California, I guess. I don't know, I don't remember. A lot of people, new people for me here. So I don't remember all names. And he was presenting, uh, he was an implantolog uh, implantologist, I guess, yes. He was presenting a lot of cases in implants, amazing successful cases in implants after 10 or, uh, 10 or more years. But I was so surprised because in all his work, I never saw a CT scan of TMJ. I never saw um, reson magnetic resonance of TMJ. So he was like 90% of dentists working and focused only on intercuspal position. If the patient has a stable occlusion, intercuspal position, it's perfect. Let's go. But what if if our patient is in burden of TMJ problems. What if our patient has already what Dawson called adaptive centric posture? We have deformation TMJ, deformation condites. What is the concept of deformation? The only point that I disagree with Dawson is exactly this. <laughs> adaptive centric posture, I mean, we cannot accept deformation as normal because as long as we have a structural deformed, we have a functional cause, a functional etiology for causing the deformation. Why? Because physiology is organized in that way that is protecting the structural anatomy, right? I mean, if crying are damaging the structure of the eyes, it does not have sense, right? If saliva or talking is destroying our mouth, that's not have sense. Or if smelling is destroying our uh, nose, this is not correct. So function in physiology is organized to be held, to be able to support the anatomy. In the moment that we have deformation, we have a dysfunction, and it's camouflaged. It's camouflaged by the muscular engram. So in these cases, that is not majority. Let, let's say it's not majority because on my point is majority, but let's say it's not majority of people. You put implants or you put a restoration or you put, put bridge and the patient has unstable TMJ, but stable occlusion, what's gonna happen? It will be an acute temporomandibular symptomatology. We caused it. 
it was the pathology was sleeping and we just wake up wake up without not taking into consideration not all people have have problem in tmj position but we cannot guess that this patient has stable tmg or this patient has not we have to check all them both it's not enough just to organize on or to offer a patient a comfortable functionality of the teeth we have to help the patient to have the treatment comfort in and out function if you are not doing this we are not helping patients we are just putting them on the edge of expressing dysfunction that probably they already have So um, I can't believe we already went an hour. My God, that was a fast hour. But I want to. I still had a couple of questions I want to ask you. Um, some there's a big thread on Dental Town that's quite uh, emotional. It's called the end of occlusion in TMD. A major crisis is on the horizon. Uh, it, it's to talk about whether uh, TMD should be a specialty with the ADA. Um, you, um, what 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 do you what do you think of the need? Should it be like? orthodontics, endodontics, pediatric dentistry, do you think TMD should be an uh, especially? Absolutely not. I was discussing with Ben Sutter, TMJ, uh, TMJ specialist here in New York, in America, pardon, and I remember one sentence from him. He said, the only dentist that has no to do with dental occlusion is the radiologist. <laughs> so, dental occlusion should not, or TMJ should not be a specialty. Is GP? All dentists have to know dental occlusion. Why? Let me give you an example of Datilio. Atilio and others, in 2005, make a very interesting experiment. They put an occlusional interference on one side of the mouth of the rat. And immediately after these occlusional interferences, the, uh, the spine, the vertebra, the column spine of the rat was totally disrupted, was totally disfigured out. After one week, Attilio think to balance the dental interference on the other side of the mouth. And immediately after balancing the, this occlusional interference, the column spine was redirected and in perfect position. What is this showing us? That even with a small feeling, we can interact and destroy not only the masticatory system, but the total skeletal system of the body. All dentists have to have, must to have knowledge, good foundation, good knowledge in dental occlusion. Otherwise, we are just damaging our patient, not helping them. And la last question, because I, I, I know it's late there. You're uh, two hours ahead of me and Phoenix right now. But um, the mixed dentition is very confusing because, you know, like Thanksgiving. You know, I think everybody saw Thanksgiving, a five-year-old, um, you know, taking a nap on the couch who's sitting there grinding their teeth. And, you know, I, I don't know if I was ever aware of this before I became a dentist, but once you're a dentist, you, you, you know, you notice so much teeth, but it seems like the older I get, the more and more times I'm witnessing five, six, seven year old kids grinding their teeth e enormously. And they're, they're in all baby teeth or they're in mixed dentition. What, how, how does your PhD in all of this apply to pediatric dentistry and the mixed dentition? Oh, hard. Let me say that if a baby patient is grinding his teeth until the six years of age is totally normal because all this grinding, all this muscular contraction is needed for the central nervous system to be maturated. The problem is not till six years of old. The problem of grinding and braxing the teeth is after six years of old when the central or the central nervous system is maturated already. This it would be a problem to dentistry. 
before six years of old is the normal process of maturation. We oh. need this pattern of movement to create engrams of the movement in our brain. After six years of old, it's a big deal. It's a big problem. It, it was such an honor to podcast you. I wish we were doing it uh, in person back in Albania. Uh, that was so much fun. Have you... Uh, um, have you seen Krenar, um, Krenar Papriniku? How, how do you say it? Krenar, Krenar Papriniku. <laughs> how, how's he doing? Oh, he's doing good. He, a couple of months ago, he sent me an email trying to have some votes for K, for K that he was trying to support. He's a very active dentist and I really respect him. He's yeah. doing great. Yeah. Well, He's got doing great. And I really respect you. I, I had so much fun in Albania. I thought the city was amazing. Uh, oh. We got to drive all around the countryside. Uh, my gosh, it was just fantastic. And congratulations on your move to America and your marriage. How long have you been married now? One year and two months. <laughs> so, so you've been in America with a new husband for a year. I don't know how, how he can handle me studying all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a, that is life, man. What a, what a wild time to, I couldn't imagine picking up and going to a new country, uh, get, getting married and going to a new country in one year. So you are a busy woman and probably uh, too busy to come on my show, but thank you so much. It's an honor to have someone who has a, a DDS, a master's in science and a PhD in occlusion to come on the show today and talk to my homies. It was an honor to podcast you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for everything. Thank you, dear heart.